Hey everybody, welcome to the Morning Devo with Boo in the house early on an all pow day. That's right, we're finishing up the book of Esther today. And as I said, when I lived in Hawaii, pow, meaning we are done. We're done with this book. Again, another book of the Bible that we get to finish up and... Uh, just say goodbye to it's really been good you know we got through ezra nehemiah and now ezra all kind of in that same kind of historical area and uh and we we see that man the bible actually has a woman as being one of the main characters of uh if you will the heroes of um this time in history for the jews actually saved the jews from genocide and so we'll read about that uh, today, a little more of kind of the history behind uh, their holiday, uh, to which they still celebrate today, this wonderful deliverance that they had uh, from the hand of Haman and the corrupted government um, and the bribery that took place. And boy, is it nice to to break free from, you know, government corruption and um, Man, that's something that seems like it would be a far, far, far stretch today, you know, to um, have uh, a freedom of, you know, collusion and issues. I mean, it seems like all the news today is just about government collusion and government involved and FBI and military. And it's all a mess and it's all money driven and it's all, you know, peop it's just unreal. You know, well, this is something that the Bible speaks of and it was dealt with back then. And it obviously is going to be dealt with today. So let's get into it. Uh, chapter nine. It says, so on March 7th, the two decrees of the king were put into effect. On that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the king's provinces to attack anyone who tried to harm them. So as the day approached for the genocide of the Jews that was initiated by Haman, who now has been impaled and killed, uh, um, the king has issued <clears throat> some decrees to go out. And one of them had to do with the Jews defending themselves, uh, being able to arm themselves and fight anybody who comes after them. And of course, there's been this, you know, backpedaling in the government to say, no, let's not, we're not to, um, you know, commit genocide on the Jewish people that are in the Persian Empire. Uh, but many people have already been filled with hate and are ready to go, are ready to kill. Uh, the Jews. Haman certainly had his propaganda uh, that went out throughout the land for um, over a year. And, um, and this kind of propaganda really stirs up people. And again, um, you know, hate can, can well up in our hearts and, uh, and do some pretty radical things to other people. Um, and, and and underneath all that hatred is jealousy, discontentment, um, you know, pride issues, a lack of humility for sure. Um, and it all leads to this kind of hate. And so it's kind of neat to see that the Jews now um, are ready to go. They have been empowered to be able to defend themselves, right? So we talked a little bit about our country and that that important idea as well. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the king's provinces to attack anyone who tried to harm them, but no one could make a stand against them for everyone was afraid of them. Interesting. Even though the government 
has said, hey, this is what we were supposed to do on this day. Now that the Jews are armed, there's a fear of like, hmm, should we really go after the Jews? Isn't that interesting? It's like, you know, if you give people the ability to defend themselves, then we have to think twice about, you know, breaking in the house and stealing something because they might literally be armed, right? They might have a weapon. You know, the reason why you don't just bum rush into something, you know, is because you just don't know what's going to happen. You just don't know what they have. You know, what do they got in their backpack? You know, is it a shank? Is it a knife? You know, is it some kind of some kind of weapon that they could use? You know, and that becomes a deterrent to a society, to people in a society of, hey, stay within your means and your boundaries. You know, don't go onto their property. You know, when it says don't trespass, don't trespass. Don't go over there, you know. Um, but if no one could defend themselves, and that was the law, right? You couldn't defend yourselves. Man, then, you know, then it's free for all, right? People can go and do whatever they want to do with no consequences at all. And the problem is, is us human beings will do just that. Um, that's how crazy we are in our hearts. And it says, but no one can make could make a stand against the Jews for everyone was afraid of them and all the nobles of the provinces, the highest officers, the governors, the royal Paul officials. This is the government, right? We're talking about the government here. The governors, the royal officials helped the Jews for fear of Mordecai because Mordecai was put in a high position. All the other government officials now started siding with Mordecai. Isn't it weird how they just flip flop? Do people flip flop today when it comes to you know, politics, when it comes to, you know, making decisions. Hmm. I imagine they do. For Mordecai had been promoted to the king's palace and his fame spread throughout all the province because he came, became more powerful. So the Jews went ahead on and appointed a day and struck down their enemies with the sword. They killed and annihilated their enemies and did as they pleased with those who hated them. In the fortress of Susa itself, the Jews killed 500 men. They also killed uh, Haman's uh, 10 sons um, uh, who were enemies of the Jews, but they did not take any plunder. So very much like the days of Joshua early on. You know, way back in the Bible, right? We've already read that, but where Joshua didn't take any plunder in a lot of those early um, um, kind of warfare situations, situations, the Jews now have the right to be able to to defend themselves in war if they are uh, come against by enemies. And, man, they killed 500 people just in the fortress of Susa itself. Pretty radical. All of Haman's sons. Mm. You know, gosh, remember that passage in the New Testament says you reap what you sow, right? You know, God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that he shall also reap. Man, you really get the idea that Haman, you know, is really reaping what he sowed. Right? He just sowed a bad seed of hatred. And now there's the fruit of that that we see right now. Mm, just really tough. Tina says, Esther's such a good book. You don't see or hear God's name in it, but you know he's there. That's right. That's right. We don't. That's an interesting part of the book, right, Tina? Is we don't see the name of Yahweh in here. But it's all threaded throughout it, right? They're praying, they're fasting stuff like that. And so that very day, the king was informed of the number of people killed in the fortress of Susa. He called for Queen Esther and said, the Jews have killed 500 men in the fortress of Susa alone, as well as Haman's 10 sons. If they have done that here, what has happened in the rest of the provinces? But now what more do you want? It will be granted to you. Tell me and I will do it. Man, the king has total favor or the Esther has total favor uh, of the king. And isn't that great? There's a proverb that talks about even our enemies will be our, in a sense, be for us. You know, um, you know, they'll be, um, we'll have favor with them. And, you know, you know, God, man, causes this to happen at times. That's really amazing um, where we just have amazing favor 
And I love how, you know, the Jews here have amazing favor where they become really politically involved and very influential in the culture of the Persian Empire, obviously. And, you know, it's interesting that a lot of people talk about the Jewish people today of being of such influence in the world, politically, socially, media, many things. And I just find that Queen Esther is kind of a forerunner of this. You see this with Mordecai, just they get involved and they really, really risk a lot. And they, they step out in faith and man, it's like things just blow up, right? And they become very influential people in the kingdom. Um, and so Esther responds to the king, if it pleases the king, give the Jews in Susa permission to do it again tomorrow as they have done today and let the bodies of Haman's 10 sons be impaled on the pole. So the king agreed and the decree was announced in Susa and they impaled the bodies of Haman's 10 sons. Then the Jews at Susa gathered together on March 8th and killed 300 more men and again took no plunder. Meanwhile, the other Jews throughout the king's provinces had gathered together to defend their lives. They gained relief from all their enemies, killing 75,000 of those who hated them. They did not take any plunder. This was done throughout the provinces on March 7th, and on March 8th they rested, celebrating their victories with the day of feasting and gladness. The Jews at Susa killed their enemies on March 7th, and again on March 8th they rested on March 9th making that their day of fasting, feasting, and gladness. So to this day, rural Jews living in remote villages celebrate an annual festival and holiday on the appointed day in late winter when they rejoice and send gifts to each other. So now they're going to talk about the commemoration of these uh, victories over their enemies in the Persian Empire. So wouldn't that be a kick today if the Jewish people still celebrated this and, and commemorated this event so long ago, um, but they still just continue to do it, um, just remembering what life was like in Persia, of all places. Not Israel, which is interesting, right? But a foreign land, the Medo-Persian Empire, a time when they were taken captive and settled in, in this land uh, in the east and of Israel. And it became conquered, you know, uh, by the Persian Empire. I mean, that's just interesting that they would celebrate a festival that really didn't have anything for them to do in Israel. It had nothing to do with really what they did at the temple. Most, most of all the festivals or all the festivals really revolved around the temple or the tabernacle, right? The place of meeting, the place of meeting of with God, with Yahweh. But here you see the beginnings of a, of a celebration of God of their victories over their enemies in a land that's far away. And so Mordecai recorded these events and sent letters to the Jews near and far throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes, calling on them to celebrate an annual festival of these two days. Two days of victory, right? He told them to celebrate these days with feasting and gladness and by giving gifts of food to each other and presents to the poor. This would commemorate a time when the Jews gained relief from their enemies. Man, what a pressure time. Huh? There's a date on the calendar that you're going to be literally killed. You can't even defend yourself. You don't have any. The government's taken all your weapons. You have nothing. And, and then all of a sudden, through the intercession of Mordecai and Esther, there is uh, an edict from the king that you're able to defend yourself just in the nick of time. And people are still coming at you. And, and now you have weapons and you can defend yourself. I mean, these are some victorious uh, celebrations for sure. I mean, man, talk about whew, sweating it a little bit. This is pretty intense. Man, have you ever faced a really intense time? Um, just super challenging, um, incredibly trying. And then finally you get over it and man, there's a time to take a break and just celebrate and reflect and be thankful. 
and here this is what's going on and boy celebrations are important are they not you know it says so the jews um their sorrow was turned to joy isn't that great and so the jews accepted mordecai's proposal and adopted this annual custom haman's son of hamadatha the agagite the enemy of the jews had plotted to crush and destroy them on the day determined by casting lots the lots were called purim but Easter, or but Esther, sorry, came and before before the king and issued a decree causing Haman's evil plot to backfire, and Haman and his sons were impaled on a sharpened pole that Haman built. Right, that is why this celebration is called Purim because it is an ancient word for casting lots. So here we get a history of the feast or the festival of Purim that Israel celebrates. Do they celebrate it today? Absolutely they do. That's right. You could participate in the festival of Purim today if you want. And again, is the Bible relevant? Absolutely. Do we see its history uh, today? Absolutely. We see what happened in the past. We see evidence for it today in our world. The festival of Purim. This is the history. The the book of Esther is the history of the festival of Purim, what happened, why they have this festival. So because Mordecai's letter and because of what they had experienced, the Jews throughout the realm agreed to inaugurate this tradition and to pass it on to their descendants, to all who became Jews. They declared they would never fail to celebrate these two prescribed days at the appointed time each year. By the way, I love this idea of becoming a Jew. All those who become Jews. Remember, we've already been told in the book that many people became Jews. And this is interesting. The Jews aren't so much a, a strict ethnic group as much as a mix of many different groups that are under Yahweh. Hmm. Interesting, right? A mix of many different types of people, kinds of people, a very diverse group, but yet all under Yahweh. And that's interesting. You know, the church in the New Testament is a diverse group of people under under the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We are very diverse. We are different. Uh, we come from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, and yet we all are one in Christ. Awesome. And it says, these days would be remembered and kept from generation to generation and celebrated by every family throughout the provinces and the cities of the empire. The festival of Purim would never cease to be celebrated among the Jews, nor would the memory of what happened ever die out among their descendants. Very important, knowing your past, knowing why celebrations take place, why we do what we do. If you forget those past, if we forget the, the lessons learned in Esther, even in our country, we're bound to repeat them. A lot of very interesting political issues in our day are very much related to the book of Esther. People groups being hated, governments wanting to put power on people, making laws through corrosion, through corruption, through economic corruption, right? Getting people rich, um, yet it's harming people. People not able to defend themselves. Many, many very relevant things to our day are in this book. And and having festivals to remember uh, what's gone on is super important. It makes us go, man, that's right. We need to remember what happened in the past so we can deal with it today. There was a time when I was younger where I always criticized, you know, festivals, you know, what you know, celebrations. And all I could see is the negative. This is part of the hegemonical power structure. And, the, you know, I would talk like that. You know, what people call woke today, we talked that way when we were growing up. And, I, you know, people, do, like, for instance, today, people maybe tip over a statue or they spray paint over a statue or they literally complain about 
a statue in a building or something like that because they, they don't they don't want they want to erase the past like the past never happened where the past did happen and there's important lessons to be learned and sometimes having a a statue as like an altar you know it's like a place of meeting it's like a place of reflecting helps us to reflect on what the bad parts were of that and what the good what what heroes came out of it what people of courage that came out of it and so you can see how man this book's even relevant to our day when it comes to kind of the cancel culture that we have trying to cancel history well the jewish people said we're not going to cancel history we're going to learn about our history and we're going to we're going to learn it so that we don't repeat it or so that we're able to talk about our present properly in light of the past see the reason why things are the way they are today is because of things that have happened in the past and sometimes people have forgotten the past and so they've gone in directions probably that are very similar to people in the past but they don't remember what happened the ramifications so i think you get what i'm saying but here the Jewish people held strong to the Feast of Purim, the Festival of Purim, to remember, right, that the memory of what would happen would never die out. The memory. Isn't that great? Why do we not just bury people in unmarked gravestones? Why don't we just dig a gigantic ditch and just throw everybody in there? Because there's a place to mem have a memory, right? Where we look at something and we see the name of our loved one and we remember. We remember what we learned. We remember those times. Whether the person was a nice person or whether the person was not such a nice person. It's important for us to remember and learn. Hmm. Very, very important. You know, if the Jewish people were to forget their history, then they would be bound to what? Repeat it. Mm. Read the book of Revelation. Wow. 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 Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote another letter putting the queen's full authority behind Mordecai's letter to establish the festival of Purim. Letters wishing peace and security were sent to the Jews throughout the 127 provinces of the empire of Xerxes. These letters established the festival of Purim, an annual celebration of the days at the appointed time, decreed by both Mordecai and the Jew, the Jew and Esther, Queen Esther. The people decided to observe this festival just as they had decided for themselves and their descendants to establish the times of fasting and mourning. So the command of Esther confirmed the practices of Purim, and it was all written down in the records. A time of fasting and prayer as well. Commemorating what? That Esther had the courage to say to Mordecai and to the king, like, you know, everything she did to say, we're going to pray, we're going to fast, and then I'm going to open up the door and talk to the king. Wow. So King Xerxes imposed a tribute throughout all his empire, even to the distant coastlands, his great achievements, and the full account of the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king had promoted, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Media and Persia. Mordecai the Jew became the prime minister with authority next to that of the king Xerxes himself. He was very great among the Jews who held him in high esteem because he continued to work for the good of his people and to speak up for the welfare of all their descendants. Now this is really neat, but Mordecai really goes in the line of Daniel. If you've ever heard of Daniel in your Bible, Daniel lived a little bit before uh, Mordecai, and he was really at the right hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who Babylon was taken, took uh, Israel, the southern tribes especially, into captivity. And the Medes and the Persians took over Babylon, if you can believe it. And so after Daniel, he was high up, a Jewish man in the government, 
and was promoted to that high position. Here later on, Mordecai gets promoted to that high position. Just as in the past, remember, there was a guy who worked with the Pharaoh in Egypt um, and he was, he got promoted to, do you remember his name? And we read about him back in the day as well, but he, he became the right hand man to Pharaoh in Egypt. And, uh, you know, so you see this pattern, um, in the Bible as well of God being with Israel, even in foreign lands, exalting them and putting him in positions of power. That's right, Tina Joseph. And could it be that even today that God is establishing, you know, his people in positions of power? Very interesting to think about um, as you see this theme just go out throughout the Bible, because this isn't the first time we see a Jewish person being at the right, um, if you will, the right seat of the king. And so uh, Mordecai became exalted and he did was what was right for his people and for his descendants. And man, what a blessing. And this is what we hope for, you know, in our day with Jewish leadership, that they really have, um, you know, their people in mind and, uh, and uh, do, what, do, do what is right. And wouldn't this be great for people in government, that they would do what is right? Oh, man, that's a big one. Do what is right. Mm. Tough. A lot of temptations. You know, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, the Bible says. So what a what an interesting book. A lot of cool things, a lot of great things for us to think about today as well. You know, Um and maybe we need to get more involved in enjoying celebratory times and maybe being able to think more about the history of our lives. And maybe that'll help us even understanding our ancestry a little better will help us understand where we're at today and how we got here today. Um, you know, nothing's wrong with looking into the past and learning from the past, um, not trying to erase the past, um, you know, we don't dwell on the past, the Bible says. Forget the former things, don't dwell on the past. But it's not that we forget the past or erase the past. So there's a big difference there. So you guys have a great day. Enjoy it. And we will start a new book tomorrow. Okay? Take care. Bye-bye.